one of the ways that we determine the uniqueness of our being, including the measure of our self-esteem, self-worth, is to see whether or not we can reconcile our actions with our beliefs and teachings. And that's important to take a moment to look through all the things that you believe in and see whether or not are you living your beliefs. Now, part of what allows a person to feel good about themselves is that first, they are living their beliefs, but more importantly, their beliefs are worth living. And a lot of people never get around to really judging the full impact of their belief systems upon everything that's an extension of that belief. A lot of people are very fanatical in honoring their beliefs, but what if a belief is flawed on any level? I don't know if you heard my radio program day on hidden agendas. Did any of you hear it? And I was asking a question, uh, simple questions, but questions that I haven't heard any reporter ask. For example, why should any company make a landmine knowing that it's going to end up ultimately hurting women and children, innocent people, and that no one's going to be responsible for digging it up once they buried it? Now, I think you've got boards of directors, mechanics, technicians, secretaries, <clears throat> you have a whole lot of people working in that company, all responsible then for that product being produced and sold, marketed and shipped and distributed. A lack of responsibility. And those people can say, yes, you know, we were, you know, uh, born again Christians or we're whatever they are. But so what? Look at the extension of everything you do. Does it honor life or does it depreciate life? And that will determine whether or not your real self-esteem is going to be positive or negative. Because herein is the distinction, and this is important. It's my experience that self-esteem is nothing that you can work on. All these books on self-esteem enhancement and workshops on self-esteem enhancement, I find they have a gross weakness in their philosophy because self-esteem should not be a goal. Self-esteem is an ever-evolving process that any given moment your self-esteem is changing based upon where you are at and what you're doing with your values. So if, if this is any indication that we're living the right life, our self-esteem should be in constant change. Think this woman before we started her lecture said that her friend told her that three years ago uh, she has changed so radically from that point that if she were to meet her old self, they, there would be uh, diametrically opposite. Well, think of what her self-esteem was like three years ago, and now think of what this self-esteem is like. Now, I'm sure that three years ago, if you were talking with her, she'd say, yeah, you know, I, I, I believe in this, I believe in that, right? You had your beliefs, you had your values, you're a professional person. Right. But it's, there's an evolution in it, an evolution in consciousness. So it's not anything that's fixed. It's nothing we can go out there and do to get self-esteem. So you can't go do some good work and, and feel good about the good work you've done and get a promotion and uh, do community service and say, yeah, I have good self-esteem because I'm a good person. See, I get acknowledgement for that. That's not how self-esteem is developed. So we start the process by looking at this, reconciling your actions with your beliefs and your teachings. Then going one step further, trying to reconcile your teachings and your beliefs with a larger reality. Therefore, I couldn't, I couldn't build, I couldn't be a part of, I couldn't own stock in a company that created nuclear arms, uh, toxic waste. Uh, anything that depreciated life would disconnect me. And my real self-esteem is based upon the inner consciousness of life versus the conditioned consciousness. There are two consciousnesses but one we rarely uh, listen to, uh, live through, and honor, so we submerge it, we call it our subconscious, something that is below the conscious, something that we only want to use when it's convenient. Oh, dear God, give me another chance. Have you ever heard that? Huh? Have you ever said that? If, if only, and then suddenly, if only something happens, in divine intervention to save someone who's got cancer, heart disease, something in your life, I'll change. Have you ever said that? You bet. 
there's when you want to touch that deeper consciousness. Because people who have real self-esteem don't have to go outside of themselves to find everything they need to make their life work, even on spiritual levels. Do you wander through a day focused on problems and hence not focused on ideals? Remember, you can't focus on two things at the same time. So what are you focused on? The problem or your ideal? The ideal is where the solutions lie, right? The problem is not. So if you're problematic in life, you start looking at the negative in everything, you're one of these, well, I would, but, and the moment I start hearing the buts, well, but, you know, I mean, I mean, if, if we, you know, didn't watch tell, and then suddenly you start hearing the excuses and rationalizations for why people engage in things that do not enhance and honor the deeper, more profound meanings of life. They waste life, waste it like it doesn't matter, like it's worth nothing. Large blocks of time in work that they shouldn't be doing, wasting idle time. There's no need to do anything with your time but at least be aware how valuable it is to do nothing. If I rest, then I absolutely rest. If I play, I value the play. The play doesn't have to have an agenda attached to it. I'm not escaping from myself into play. When many people go out to play, they go gambling. They do things merely because it's a distraction for a period of time from facing the day-to-day -day grind that they're in. But they're coming back to it. It's like a reprieve. You're let out. You're, you're, you're given a furlough from prison, but you're coming back in three days. That's not a life. That also shows that you don't value the time because you're never going to be happy with what you're doing because part of your mind the whole time that you're engaging in this fun and escape is still thinking about your problems. Because when the mind isn't constantly preoccupied, back you go to the problem. Well, how do you get beyond the problem? How do you not look at the problem? How do you keep the problem becoming more essential than you? By looking at what the ideal is. Ideals always transcend problems. Knowledge is supposed to give us an answer. Wrong. A new way of knowing gives us an answer. The new way of knowing, whatever that way may be, transcends the limitations of knowledge. Because look at who we respect most in our society. The people are supposed to have the most sacred knowledge. In any institution, it is the most knowledgeable person that directs us. Where have they directed us? The greatest minds in international finance and, and sociology who run the World Bank and International Monetary Fund have virtually decimated entire cultures, indigenous tribes all over the world. They have showed no respect for the sanctity of life. Now, in their minds, they were trying to help people. Well, what you need is you need another uh, structural adjustment. You're not exploiting, exploiting your local crops. You're not getting enough cash crops. You've got all this good land. And you could make more money, balance your payments. And we're going to give you a, a new highway. We're going to give you electric uh, power where there is none. We're going to build a dam where there's none. And no one is suggesting, well, hold on a second. Have you spent time here to see how that might affect the people in the long term? How many species of animals and plants are going to be destroyed? How many people are going to be dislodged? Now, they're going to have to pay for something that they're not benefiting from that actually undermine them. You're indebting people. That's the power of knowledge. So knowledge in itself, in the way we look at it, has become too sacred. And scientific knowledge has become the ar ultimate arbiter in all issues. But science itself is flawed because today's absolute becomes tomorrow's, well, you know, it doesn't work. Look in AIDS, cancer, heart disease, look in diabetes, look in arthritis, look in mental illness. Forty million Americans have been classified as mentally ill. How many actually are mentally ill? Yet how many might have imbalances due to um, diet, sugar, called attention deficit disorder? I would guesstimate that probably up to 80% of the people who are called mentally ill are not, that they're either going through periods of normal loss and remorse, which will affect them, or they're going through biochemical adjustments, or they're toxic, in which case by detoxifying and rebalancing and giving them the nurturing, 
mo emotionally and physically, you can change people. I see it all the time. But I see it because I'm not a believer in any paradigm having the answer. I don't believe in knowledge. I believe in experience. And experience transcends knowledge. The knowledge that comes from academia is that if you're a professor hiding away in some institution and you're working on a bunch of mice, what you find in a petri dish or some mice suddenly is supposed to replicate all of the dynamics and integrate it in, into relationships of life. And it doesn't. But remember, they're not the ones to blame. You're equally culpable if you believe that they have something so sacred that without them, you can't function. So institutional values the educated mind ultimately becomes the mind that in the context that it is used today undermines all values instead of enhancing it. So when we tell people to get an education so you can get a better job, they learn techniques, but they do not have a new way of knowing. So look at all the people who went out with their MBAs to rush out there out of pure unmitigated greed, right? In the 1970s and 80s, boy, that did us a lot of good, didn't it? All right? Right now, yesterday, uh, two days ago, in the merger of uh, uh, two major corporations, uh, uh, Kimberly Clark and another paper company, they said they were going to you know, lay off now 6,000 people. You know, six, uh, six or 60,000 people. 6,000 people. All right? Who was looking after their interest? Not the people involved. There was a lack of consciousness, and yet their knowledge of how to get the merger, raise the money, create the debt, create the infrastructure was great enough, but the knowledge was not great enough in its holistic model to look after everyone's interest. And ultimately, we pay for all that. All the time, we pay for that. So the idea is if you spend your time looking at problems, and hence, you don't focus on the ideals, you'll never have an ideal that you'll follow. You'll stay stuck on the problems. And the people who are supposed to help you overcome the problems. And rarely will you find anyone who is as compassionate, understanding, and insightful as your own intuitive being for your own problems. No one ultimately helped you or will help you with your weight or you with your dynamic. You do that. The best anyone can do is simply act as a catalyst. And the moment they can't be an unconditional catalyst, then they lose the opportunity to be really uh, complete in their giving. But what institution wants to help you without you becoming chronically obedient, addicted, or connected to the institution? Right? I know people who can't wait to get out of work to go to their support groups because they're addicted to the support groups. They love getting up and saying, I'm an addict. I'm out of control. But you said that last week and last month. I know, but I'm an addict. <laughs> says who? Who says it? Someone who wrote a book that says every time that you know you have an addiction, it's an addiction for life, and every day you've got to live one life at a time, one day at a time. Nonsense. You've just you've just substituted addictions. I've never met anyone who's truly healthy who goes to those things. Because they're constantly substituting hard drugs for something else. I know, I have a friend who, oh, this person every night down at the ranch had to go off uh, uh, to AA, OA, or something else, you know, and proselytize constantly. Three weeks after my brother and I were off the ranch, this guy sells our lawn mowers, sells uh, <laughs> some animals, goes off to Shreesport and gambles the money, right? But then immediately goes back into his thing. I, I went off the wagon. <laughs> Well, I said, that's nice, right? <laughs> Do you use data to change or deny its significance? Now, let's say that you have a series of facts, all right? Facts. Statistics, facts, knowledge. How do you use it? What significance does it play in your life? The moment someone tells us their facts, we are then influenced by their facts. For example, if you give, live in a given neighborhood and someone says that crime has gone up uh, and physical assault has gone up and robberies have gone up, suddenly everyone in that neighborhood panics. And now you become extremely defensive. You start trusting nothing or no one. You want to become a gated community. You want anyone who you perceive as is a threat not to get into that community. <clears throat> Just facts. 
I'm always careful about data because I see how easily it can be manipulated. I hear people using data to run off to help people in a, another country, and yet we have 40 million Americans who can't even get health care in our country who go to bed malnourished each night, and we have over 4 million people who are homeless in the United States. I don't hear anybody paying attention to them. You know? As if what we don't want to pay attention to doesn't exist. It's not significant. It's not one of our essential facts. Now, when they want to run for office, when they want to get our attention, when someone wants to show that they're doing something, then they give us the facts. So I ask you, question the facts. Question the facts and see it's their real significance. To what or whom do you give your loyalty and why? Now, that's a very important question. Let me give you an idea of this. Let's say that you are a physician and you're a surgeon. All right? Now, as a surgeon, and let's say you're a thoracic surgeon, you can do two operations in a day, two coronary bypasses. But someone sends you some statistics showing you that of three studies done, from 35 to 85% of those operations did not improve the quality or longevity of a person's life. And when you factor in the high level of mortality up to 15% uh, for people 60 and over from heart attacks while during the operation or immediately after, the fact that 100% of those uh, veins that were replacing arteries are going to reocclude, and the high cost and the suffering and the secondary infections that can occur during, with the blood and all other procedures in the hospital, then it's not even a matter that if you have two procedures, one is a non-invasive procedure using just medication, the other is a highly invasive procedure using surgery, that they both are equal, then they're not really equal when you factor in mortality and, and all these other complications. And clearly, it's unequal. But we don't see a lessening of operations. And you should. You should see concomitant 35 to 85% less operations. You actually see an increase in operations by almost 25% per year. Now it's over 400,000 operations per year, coronary bypass. Not only that, but we don't even get to where we will measure the difference between the drug and a non-invasive change of life. Now this week in the New York Times, they talked about a new drug, a miracle drug, that's supposed to help people with stroke. Now, if you read it carefully, and if you read the actual studies, you would see it doesn't extend your life, and it doesn't prevent stroke. But it's extremely expensive, and they didn't tell you, but I have the actual study, that there's a side effect to it. Now, there were four studies showing that magnesium sulfate that cost about $5, $5, has no side effects, has a greater efficacy rate, and with such less expense, it should be used. Instead, people are using a $2,200 single-time drug with brain hemorrhaging as a side effect and not as effective. Now, in a society that values facts, then why are they only using one source as facts? That's the loyalty factor. The media has to be loyal to one group. That group has to be loyal to its own philosophy, even when that philosophy is not the best and is antiquated and is actually barbaric. And so we're stuck in the phenomena of not knowing who to, who to believe. So when you don't know who to believe because you've been told to mistrust anyone who challenges the basic paradigm, then you are either left with complete rejection of all beliefs or you hang on to the single belief that you were taught to believe in, the orthodox view. And that's why you don't see any great public uh, <coughs> outpouring against any major issue on any topic in the United States. No matter what the issue, the vast majority of people can always be counted upon to follow the status quo. And I've not seen that challenged. Do you know that there's only right now 2% of the American population who are vegetarian? Two. And there's less than one half of 1% strict vegetarians, like myself. Only one half of 1%. Now, is it because there's a lack of knowledge? 
Is it because there's a lack of exposure of information that could allow a person the tools and steps and insights to change? No. There is? And what? What's deficient? I'm just getting out the information about the stuff you're reading in your book. I would have done it a long time ago. It was presented to me. Okay, you've made a good point. Listen to what this gentleman just said. He would have done it a long time ago, meaning changing his diet. And I'm curious I didn't a long time ago. If, if someone would have gotten the information to him. Now, what does that say about him? You're waiting for someone to come up and save you. I was. You were. I realize now. But now you realize you've got to save yourself, right? That's a very important awareness. Right. I realize, realize I've been betrayed from A to Z. So you've been betrayed. Who betrayed you? I trusted them too much. Who betrayed you? Ultimately, I betrayed myself. You betrayed yourself. Don't blame I them. Good. That's important. That's a very positive step to take responsibility. No one betrayed you out there. They're simply engaged in their beliefs. You gave your loyalty. That's what I just asked. You gave your loyalty to them because you felt without their knowledge and insight and direction, you were powerless. So how could you become a vegetarian if someone didn't give you all the information you needed, then convince you after they gave it to you that it was essential, then discipline you or admonish you or create fear in you, but we see that fear is not a great motivator. Fear doesn't stop people from committing crimes. The death penalty has never been a deterrent. Heavier drug sentencing and mandatory sentencing has never stopped people from using drugs, distributing uh, drugs or manufacturing them. But we don't understand that. So we keep saying, well, all we need is more laws, more prisons, more guards, more money, and we will do something about drugs. Well, gee whiz. Now, because I'm not a part of any belief system, I can say, OK, let me take a look at what is. We have more drug addiction, more crimes, more money being spent, and more arrests, more people in prison, 1.3 million Americans in prison. That's more than any other nation in the world. Well you haven't done anything about the problem. Nothing. Therefore, since you've done that year in and year out, deck in, decade in and decade out, then you simply are wrong. Your basic underlying philosophy is wrong. So let's take a completely different route. Let's go off here and do this. Let's look at the, what is making a person use a drug to begin with. A person would only use a drug if it were substituting for something more essential in a person's life. What could be more essential in a person's life? Until you look at that, what is defective in the person's belief, development, that's causing them to want to do something knowingly self-destructive? Don't focus on the high they're getting. Because if they have to get an artificial high, then it means the high of life is not enough. And if the life high is not enough, then they're using it to escape life. What's so bad about the life? And what's bad about the life is their beliefs. Because if your beliefs are solid, then every other reality you need, you'll make happen from that belief. If your beliefs are flawed, then you'll look for constant distractions so you don't have to face what you really feel and the full impact. You'll use <clears throat> any form of distraction so you don't have to wake up each day and saying, I don't like how I feel. I don't like what I'm doing. I don't like where I live. I feel helpless. I feel alone. I feel alienated. I'm going to take a drug to escape that. I'll get an artificial feeling of good even if I know I'm destroying myself and risking my life, and I don't have the money to support it, and so my work's going to suffer, my friend's going to suffer, everyone's going to pay a price, but by God, I'm, I'm so out of touch with everyone and anything that's essential and any sense of love and respect for anyone, including myself, that the only place I can hide is in some false illusionary state that's artificially created by sticking a needle in my vein. That is what causes drug addiction. What about teenagers? A 10-year-old kid. A 7-year-old kid can have a defective character because of how they have been raised. You cannot have something replace the pain in a child that is not going to encourage the child to become more understanding of their options if the child isn't respected. If the child has been given things but not unconditional love, then the child is going to feel that what they didn't give, get, the unconditional love, is not there to be given. They'll see people going in and out of doors 
busy on cellular phones, constantly busy, attached to their work, their projects, but not with them. And if you don't have that absolute intimate connection with the child during the formidable years when they need it, that very narrow window, then that child will realize, I've tried, I don't have all the ways, and I haven't looked at the consequences in my most innocent moments of what I'm going to say. As a result, you didn't hear what I was saying. You didn't want to play. You didn't want to be with me. Therefore, something must be wrong with me. So I'll find something out there or someone out there who will accept me. And even if I have to go through rituals of self-abuse or abusing others, as long as someone accepts me and says I'm OK, it's good enough. On very primal levels, when we do not allow a person to be connected with their spiritual sense and ours as well and share unconditional time and joy, then we create a person who by the merest of circumstance can become a delinquent, a killer, a drug addict, and or lost in the same kind of uh, materialistic nonsense that 90% of the baby boomers have been lost in. You look at the most destructive generation in history, it's our generation. At least our parents and grandparents gave us a lot more time than we've given our own children. We've given children things and bragged about the things and then expected them to be like us. Well, we didn't take drugs. We worked hard. Yeah, but this is a child. When did you allow him to be a child? The yuppies are so convinced of, of that all their kid needs is more information and more data. They plug them into classes at the age of two. They're taking computers, courses, and, oh, well, look, my child has got their own word processor and computer, and they're three years old. <laughs> Well, when do you allow them a chance to play? Well, you know, they got, they got a whole life to do that. And then they start looking at their own life. Well, I work 16 hours a day so they can have this stuff. Yeah, well, what do they have? A lot of expensive toys. All the child wanted was you, not what you were giving them materialistically. I've never seen a dog, a cat, a parakeet, a horse, a cow, a child want anything more than just some love given and received, a back and forth. You don't have to have anything more to it than that. But that's the one thing a whole generation lost touch with, the essence of self shared unconditionally. You go talk, as I have, with the kids who are drug addicts from upper mobile families who are delinquent, doing abusive things, and you ask them, why are you taking your anger out on this black guy here? When I saw once, one night I was walking up Riverside Drive and I saw a bunch of uh, teenagers harassing this black guy. And so I went over and I broke it up. And uh, they were making themselves believe that the black guy was responsible for their anger. And therefore they could justify it by him being black. And I said, take a look at what's missing in your own lives. This black guy didn't cause your hatred, your anger, your bigotry, your racism. Go home and look in your own home. That's where it belongs, not here. So look at our policymakers. Do you think any institution, do you think any religion is going to open itself up to be examined for its underlying uh, dysfunction, its false beliefs? Not for a second. So therefore, since no institution, no individual can be honest about its defects, since no group of surgeons can be honest about their exploitation of patients' ignorance, and since they, are re since they are revered and they are protected by the exclusivity of their guilds and groups and sacred uh, fraternities, they can get away with this indefinitely, and they have. They will not change. Institutions do not change. Individuals do. So do not expect any institution or its leadership to ever be honest about anything. It can't be. If it were, and we laid open a real forum for what's wrong with society, 99% of all people would see that most of what they do in life is wrong. And how much pain would a person have to experience to reject and let go of what doesn't work? And that's why we've got a world that's in such a mess. People say, oh, things are great. Yeah, for whom? Where? We had 35 million kids die last year of malnutrition. 35 million. That's a lot of people for one year to die. 
Now, we got 250 million children working in, in child labor, six, seven years old. We have over one million women alone just in the Orient sold into prostitution by their families. Those are going to have very short and painful lives. Uh, take a careful look at everything and see how much real joy there is. The vast majority of people are not happy. Most of everything in life doesn't work. Medicine doesn't work except in the small percentage of emergency medicine. Nutrition doesn't work. Look at the consequences of the American diet. Our educational system doesn't work. Look what it teaches us. Indoctrinating principles and belief systems that are flawed. Well, then what works? You can't know what works until you step out of the existing paradigm to honestly look at it. And then you get this extraordinary experience of no one inside wanting to hear what you have to say. I mean, they get real intimidated and angry, and they just want you to shut up, die, go away. They don't want to hear from you. Yeah. So these lost children, would you say that in person, a catalyst is essential for these to be lost? Good point. The, que the question is, uh, for people who are lost, can other people act as a catalyst? You bet they can. It, it's not essential, but it's helpful. Because a lot of people, once they've been rejected by their family, or at least not getting what they need by the family, and then they tie in with other people who will frequently support them, but in negative ways, then they don't know what to believe in any longer. So if you have someone come along who's no longer in the group demanding they prove that they're tough by going out and beating someone up uh, or robbing someone, or that, they're, you know, that they have to be more, more obedient to the father and mother's beliefs, and those are the two primary ones they have, you have to be very neutral. You can't come on laying your beliefs on anyone. And the trouble is, during the 1980s, probably five to maybe even 10 million baby boomers went into cults and gave everything ahead to the cults because they knew that what they were doing was wrong, but they didn't know where else to go. So they were looking for anyone who would tell them what's wrong with life. Yeah, all these cults were masterful. They could tell you exactly what was wrong, and they were all right. What they were saying was wrong. But what they were saying was right was not right. It was just one more flawed, manipulative belief system. And so people bought into them and still are. Or people finally went back into Orthodox religions. More people in the last 10 years have gone back into Orthodox religions because then they can have it all done for them. Let, some, let God, let their preacher, let their religion do it for them. Save them. Well, how many of those people do you want around you? <laughs> they are very intolerant. They are, they are an army of ignorance that will non-thinkingly attack anything. They are dangerous. Come on in, you back in the back and have a seat. Now, getting warmed up here, now you know you gotta think about where your loyalty lies, who you give it to, and why. Now let's go to, come on right and get a, get a seat there. Do you correct your behavior, your values, your beliefs, your actions when you see that there is a better way? Do you? Yes. You do? Yes, we do. Good. Why? Because if it doesn't work, why keep doing it? Good. Well, now that makes sense. Then why, if you were a doctor and you were uh, giving people chemotherapy and it didn't work, why would you keep giving them chemotherapy? I'd probably try something else. You'd try something else then you should get a doctor's degree. <laughs> Let's get rid of 99% of the ones that are out there. Why else? Why else would you try something? Well, if you really, uh, if you really engage life, then you naturally are going to have that kind of a perspective. Like, And sometimes, which is not always good, but sometimes you might change even if something works just to see, well, what would this do? Maybe I'll try this, and just, just because you're that kind of person where 
I just like to see how things work, and, and you know, maybe this will work, maybe it won't, but I could always change if it doesn't work. That's right. That's a good point. The hardest thing to give up, but the most essential thing is knowledge. When you're able to give knowledge up and all that it gains you, you're free to grow. When you can't give up knowledge, when knowledge becomes so sacred that your entire being, your self-esteem, your principles of endeavor are based upon the knowledge, then you're stuck with whatever that knowledge is. And if that knowledge is not perfect, then all of its imperfections you're ultimately going to be perpetuating. Not only for yourself, but everyone you come into contact with. And since we're all interconnected, think of every teacher that teaches flawed knowledge. Think of engineers and designers and architects. Think of all the people who do the wrong things, but they consider it right because they're not willing to learn any other principles. They got their degrees. They got their MSs, PhDs, their medical degrees. They're in a position of authority, so they assume because of where they're at and how hard it took them to get there that that's all there is to know. Remember, when you can give up knowledge, you're at the first stage of real growth. If you cannot give up knowledge, you're not. I wrote a book on food combining. Three years later, I bought up every coffee and burned them. That was a best-selling book. I took it out of print. I've taken five of my books out of print because the knowledge that was in them was not good enough, and I had new knowledge to replace it. So when people say, well, you said, yeah, yeah, so, so what? That's what I said. Well, that's not what I'm saying now. I'm saying something different. But we don't even allow people to have that flexibility. We expect people to stand by your word. Well, what's the word? The word should not have a value of more than what it is in that moment. Allow it to be fluid. Everything in life should be fluid. Everything. There should be nothing that is so solid, nothing so permanent, nothing so transfixed in time that it cannot adapt and change and transform itself. And yet we value that which is so stable. Well, how does something get stable? It becomes orthodox. It plants its roots so deep and its dogma so deep and its ritual so deep that there is no capacity for it to change. But what if everything else changes around it? Too bad for it. It stays locked in time. And that's almost every institution. Yet everything in life changes. Everything, every moment, change with it. Now, of course, you're going to make a lot of other people insecure in your life. They're going to think something's wrong with you. And had this been 40 years ago, oh, that would have been a clear diagnosis for a, uh, a psychosis. See? And today it's just being irresponsible. We'll even make it that. It's not. No, it's not. But remember, when you start to change and you've gotten the freedom to change and let go and embrace new, don't assume everyone else in your life is going to appreciate it and do the same. You're going to find yourself alone a lot of the time. Better to be alone with the knowledge you have that's allowing you to grow than to be surrounded by people who are stuck in a place that doesn't work. This is important. Which is more essential? Being good, feeling good, doing good, or being authentic? Okay, you said doing good, all right? Being authentic. Feeling good. Okay, who said feeling good? Okay. All right, good. Let's go through each one of these. All right, who said being good? Someone did. All right. Why, why is it more essential to be good? Okay, so if you are, if being good so if you strive to be good. Okay. okay. Well, let's say good in this respect is something that we could all accept as something that's good. All right? It's something positive. Okay, let me... No, no, no. Two different things here. I, I understand, but I want to show you how it could be construed. A lot of people like to be good without understanding that they themselves are not a being of goodness, but rather are trying to project goodness 
by assuming that if they do good for other people, they will feel better about themselves. And think of how many times you have met people in your life who were good, but were not good to themselves. They really didn't believe in any authentic sense of self of goodness. But they spent their whole life doing good for other people. That is a person that inside has no real sense of self-esteem. So therefore, they're getting their self-esteem by being good. That's a false way of getting self-esteem. It doesn't work because it's not authentic. Yes? Well, that's, you're right. You're right. The, the question she raised, for those of you who couldn't hear it, was frequently these people are always um, adding up psychically what they've done good, right? And when pushed, they'll suddenly bring up this whole tally that you should respect me. Look at all the good I've done. Have you done as much good? So they're measuring the goodness as if it's a measurement of their self-value and self-esteem. So they've tied their self-esteem into their good deeds. A real good deed should be one that is done with humility and true pride for knowing that you've done something is a natural extension of the real and authentic self. When efforts come from the authentic self, they're never forced. There's a fluidity. There's a natural motion. There is a, flu there is a, a rhythm. The rhythm of life is a subtle rhythm. It vibrates in the sense of complete being. That is the theta level. The theta level is one that where you can induce through mantras, through running, through repetitive action, a state, deep meditative state, where there is no conflict between a sense of being in the moment, where all you are is in the moment, and the moment itself. So you don't know where you're at as differentiated from self. When I was racing tonight, I put my mind in that theta state. So when I was running, I wasn't thinking and looking at the crowd, the other people I was competing with. I wasn't looking at my foot to see if I was, you know, pushing off strong enough. I was simply there. Now, if any of you have ever seen a race where the lead runners go by, there's such an ease. It almost looks effortless, like they're just floating. There's such a gracefulness because they're in the moment. There's a special place that runners will get. And when you get into that place, you simply are. There is no thought. None. There's no, I must. None. It's just, you are. And there's where your full potential, because only in a true sense of being, you connect with everything. The theta state has no conflict, none. And that's the only time we should make our primary decisions because then we're not in conflict. We're not defending values we shouldn't. We're not protecting things we shouldn't. We're not afraid of looking at issues. We simply are. So when you are in a theta state which comes from exercise, from meditation, from chanting, then you can simply be connected to all things. There's no fear. No fear of race, differences, skinny, fat, young, old. There's no fears. There's a connectedness of all things. That's the sense of being. Now, that's what comes when we are doing something that is good from a natural extension of self. So be careful if you're a person or you know people who are, try to be good but don't believe that they're really good. Feeling good, now you mentioned feeling good. In life, if you're balanced, you're going to feel good. And therefore, as natural extension of feeling good, what you do is going to be good because there's no conflict between what you feel and what you're willing to share. Yes, it's completely authentic. It's a very important point. Therefore, what we extend of ourselves becomes the true self. There's no mask. There's no hidden agenda. There's no manipulation. What you see is what you get. What we say is what we mean. What we share is what we feel. There's no message behind the message. There's no duplicity. 
No, that's from the authentic self, and that's the self you were talking about. Now, think of the people, however, who, who uh, find it more essential to feel good and therefore spend all their time trying to create an artificial sense of feeling good. Well, if we only had more sex, I'd feel good, right? If I could only, you know, if I only, and suddenly it's if the only, then I would feel good. And they can fill in the blanks. But that means that without that, then they don't feel good. Always look at what you're trying to achieve, and what you're trying to achieve is where you are in your opposite, because you're always at the opposite end of what you're trying to achieve. Being honest about it is what's important. If you're trying to get skinny, then it means you're fat, even on a psychic level. If you're trying to be good, then you don't really feel that you are good, because there is an effort, which means there's a conflict. The conflict is trying to resolve itself between what I want to be and where I'm at. But where I'm at is not what I want to acknowledge, because then I wouldn't like how I feel. So I'll make up something. Well, I'm working on being good. Well, what does that mean? Better to be honest about where we are in the moment and acknowledge it, because by acknowledging it, you at least disempower it. It is a process. The process is acknowledging what you are so you can then no longer give a false allegiance to it. If my friend simply said, instead of saying, I'm an addict, <clears throat> which is an excuse for him then to be addicted, if he says, I'm a person who has no inner discipline and I will acknowledge my lack of choices when I have no discipline, I choose not to be disciplined. That's a choice. When I choose not to have discipline, when I choose not to respect myself, then therefore I have no respect for anyone else. How can you respect someone else when you don't respect yourself? You can't. You'll need people. You'll manipulate a name exchange with people, but there's a game. So therefore, if a person said what they really were, then they no longer allow that to have the power to play its game because it's, a light has been shown on it. Now the process says, if I know what I am in this moment, then I can change. If you say you're addicted, it is an excuse. It is not a, addiction is not a noun, it's a verb. So if we, if we change the metaphor here, then saying, I right now have no sense of self-discipline, and I have no sense of self-respect, and I have no sense of self-esteem that's authentic. I'm going to make that happen, however. For every action that I have a choice of whether to be disciplined or not, focused or not, happy or not, positive or not, I'm going to choose that which powers me. And the power comes from the positive choice. I will still have my opposite always present, but at least I will acknowledge it. I will say, you are my companion, but you are not going to make the decision. I can't deny you. I can't hide you, but I will not empower you. That's the difference. And that's why the moment you know you're capable of doing anything, and every human being is capable of doing anything, then the person who does not do the negative things, who has the real sense of self, is the person who is the most aware. That's the authentic power of self. So be very careful about people always trying to feel good. Because when people try to feel good, it means they do not feel good. And therefore, their effort of feeling good is not coming from anything authentic, so anything that makes them feel good is merely a, a, an addiction. And that's where you get into addictive relationships, where people use each other trying to feel better about who they are. They're trying to get feedback, emotion, but it's an empty pit. No matter what you give them the next day, you have to start all over again. Fill it back up, and then it drains out. Fill it up, drains out. How many times have you given all your energy to fill someone back up about how much you care about them, and it's all gone, and you got to keep redoing it? Then you should be finding someone else. Doing good. Doing good. It's like being good. A person can be good, but not do anything good. 
And then there's people who can do good, but not be good. Being authentic is what is essential. Because when you're authentic, whatever you do is who you are. If you have a real honest sense of self, you are less likely to be anxious, fearful, and insecure. That's one of the first tests of how authentic you are to yourself and a real sense of self-esteem that comes from the normal processes of life. You won't feel gross anxiety. You won't feel insecurity. Because how can a true love of self create insecurity? It can't. Again, look at, look at, the, look at the paradigm. If you have been empowering yourself by gaining and giving up, reforming and challenging knowledge, institutions, yourself, behavior, then there's a confidence that evolves from that. And you don't need anyone else's approval to do it. You have the confidence to stand alone. And if you don't have the confidence to stand alone, then you have no real value uh, that is as great as your self-esteem. So the self-esteem is completely lacking. So there's an artificial self-esteem. It is a pragmatic self-esteem. It is a superimposed self-esteem. So you'll try to get the self-esteem by doing things superficially. And you'll commit yourself to a whole lifestyle of artificial endeavors to gain a self-esteem that's not authentic. Whereas when you are authentic, the self-esteem is there, then you're not afraid of anything. There are no insecurities stopping you from doing anything. Remember, if you've wanted to do something and you haven't done it because you didn't truly believe in yourself, then you have no authentic self-esteem. Then the game is up. That's one way of mirroring yourself. All the time I hear people saying, yeah, well, you know, it's, I'm, I'm, you know I, I could do it. No, don't tell me what you could do. Show me how you would do it and why. People with good self-esteem don't ever live this life that so many Americans are filled with fear and insecurity and always blaming their insecurity and fears and things out there for why they're not doing something in here. That's self-esteem. Can you have self-respect that is not real? Can you? <laughs> Are you a speech writer for Clinton? <laughs> Be honest. No. Yes and no. Why do you say no? You cannot. Because if we're really defining self-respect, self-esteem, you know, from an authentic perspective, you can't it can't be fake. Can't be. Um, what was the exact word? There? The exact word is: Can you have real uh, self-respect that is not real? Real self-respect must be authentic. All right, but we can have a superficial self-respect, and that's what most people have. Look at most of your corporate leaders; they have self-respect. Right? But it's a superficial self-respect. It's based upon other people acknowledging them. Uh, you can have politicians who have self-respect and will, will, you know, ma will parade their self-respect because they pass some legislation. But it's not authentic. What about when you have self-respect? Um, no. Again. No, it's not, self-respect is not broken up into bits and pieces. Either something is, is or it isn't. Either you are aware of self. It's like saying, I have, I have self-love, but, but not in all areas of myself. I mean, there's a lot of myself I don't love, and some things I do love. I mean, I, I, I'm really a, com uh, I, I'm a completely spiritual person, and, but not on all areas. I mean, I can kill people and, and hate people, uh, but I'm a spiritual person. Think about your question. Yeah, well, moderation is a fool's notion. 
A moderate amount of a poison is no less poisonous, just takes longer for it to manifest. Isn't that sort of like a, an artificial step to self -respect? Sure it is. People who don't want to be challenged and don't feel the strength of their convictions will say, oh, I only, you know, I, I only, you know, do things in moderation. <laughs> what do you do in moderation? Well, drink, smoke, you know, <laughs> beat the wife, kick the kid, you know, <laughs> kill the dog. Shoot the neighbor, uh, rob the bank, but small bills only. <laughs> Fives and tens. Didn't take anything higher than that. Yes. Yeah. I mean, moderation in what? Could you be a moderate racist? Oh, George Bush. There's a good. <laughs> Richard Nixon, right? They're moderate. How do you know that what you believe and how you feel are authentic? How do you know? How do you know? Because it means it's your own reality. You may not think I'm real. I think I'm very real. <laughs> oh, I think you're real, but you don't want to know what I think you're real of. <laughs> Not everyone. Most people live someone else's reality. Good. Yes. I don't think you have to. Yes. Yes. What else? She's. You wouldn't have to defend yourself. All right. I think you'd also feel. Uh, centered and connected, you wouldn't, you, you would feel uh, peaceful, I guess, is what I'm looking for. You would feel an inner sense of balance. When you know what is right, it resonates that it's right. When it's not right, but we want to make it right to connect with something in our external environment, then we have to argue ourselves into believing it. And there's where the power of convincing ourselves, talking ourselves, selling ourselves becomes more significant than what we felt. So if after all my arguments, after all my mind games, if that feeling still resonates, then that's what's true. And that's what should be gone by. And that's the power of intuition. That's the inner voice. That's that inner consciousness. Intuition and consciousness and spirituality are all the same, just different terms. It's just trying to get to it. And that's where the authentic self is.